<laughs> and Leslie, thank you for your uh, music leadership and your prayer. That was very, very encouraging. Yeah. I don't think I can begin uh, to this morning without thanking all of you, and I really do mean all of you. I mean faculty, administration, and students for the honor that you give me every day. I'm certainly honored to be here as a speaker. Grant is right. I got to graduate from the greatest college in the country, which is this one. And as a proud alum, as a proud alum, you honor me every day by what you do here on this campus. Uh, affects me. Just last Monday, I was sitting in my office, and a guy in my office looked up at my wall, saw the degree on my wall, and he said, hey, did you, you graduate from Covenant College? And instantly, I was filled with pride. Hopefully not a bad pride, hopefully a thankful pride. Instantly, I was filled with pride and, and was excited to tell him all about my experience here at Covenant, what this college was. And let me just tell you, without what you're doing every day on this campus right now, uh, again, as students, as faculty, as administration, um, I wouldn't have that pride. That degree is worth more now than it was the decades before because of people like you who've invested in this. So thank you for that. Thank you for what you're doing for me. Our passage this morning is 2 Timothy chapter 2. Beginning, of, We're going to read just a few verses in there. And as you're turning to that in your Bibles or on your devices, let me just remind you of the context of this passage. Um, Timothy, 2 Timothy is... The, uh, the, the, the book of the Bible that uh, was the last letter that Paul wrote. It was the, um, uh, the most personal of Paul's letters. It uh, was writing to this young pastor who we know struggled with timidity. He was, he was a little nervous about his leadership. And here he's leading this church in this amazing metropolitan city of Ephesus. And he's facing opposition from without. The culture is pushing against him and challenging him. But he's also facing, as we learn from uh, the uh, book of Timothy and also from Ephesians, he's facing opposition within. And this older father in the faith, Paul, wants to speak God's truth into his life in order that he might not be afraid, but know how to handle this opposition both from without and from within. So follow along with me as I read from 2 Timothy Chapter 2, beginning at verse 22, this is God's word. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, Correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, after being captured by him to do his will. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we sit before your word this morning, we would ask two things of you. By your Holy Spirit's power, would you open up our minds that we might be able to see in your word what you want us to see, to understand what you are saying to us. And Father, would you also inflame our hearts that we might grow in our love and our relationship with you. Do those two things for the sake of your son's name, we pray. Amen. One of my favorite memories of being a student here on this campus was experiencing some of the sports rivalries. And I'm not just talking, in fact, I'm not talking at all today about the rivalry that existed in soccer with Covenant and Bryan College. No, my favorite one, is that a woo for Bryan College or the soccer team? I don't know. My favorite one was actually in basketball. It doesn't exist anymore because the university actually closed up shop in 2015 and combined with another university out in North Carolina. But the basketball rivalry between Covenant College and Tennessee Temple University back in the day was a huge deal. And I think it was a huge deal because this university, which was this huge Baptist university at downtown, uh, in downtown Chattanooga, um, was first of all right in our city. So the, so the tension was right there. I think it was also a huge deal because they were incredible at basketball. We were good at basketball. They were incredible at basketball. Now, they were five times our size, and I don't know what recruiting rules they had, but it seemed like they were different as far as what they got. I remember that my junior year, they had at that time two freshman All-Americans 
who were, uh, if they weren't seven feet, they were right at seven feet. Two forwards who were just amazing. And every time we played Tennessee Temple, um, we would gear up for it. We would get all into it, again, because of this rivalry. I, I would also add that there was another piece to this rivalry, and that's this. Tennessee Temple was this huge Baptist university. I can say this because I grew up Baptist. Covenant College Presbyterian. There was this little Presbyterian Baptist thing going on too, you know? You're laughing because you're like, yeah, I know. That's right, yeah. Right? And Presbyterians look like, oh, we want to beat the Baptists. And I guess the Baptists say, oh, we want to beat the Presbyterians. So we went down there with all this tension, and as best we could, we packed out uh, our little student section, and we had signs, we had cheers and chants, we were ready to go into this game. I don't know that any of us had any thought that we had ever a chance of winning, but maybe there'd be some miracle uh, that would take place. And I remember in this one particular game, we're down there at Tennessee Temple University, and we're all into it, signs, chanting, cheering, and at the beginning minutes of the game, it's staying close, like they haven't run away with it. And we're handling these two seven-foot guys. And I remember this one moment where the score, I believe, was tied or close to it. We inbound the ball. Covenant inbounds the ball. And out of nowhere, one of these seven-foot guys slips past, steals the ball, and like from here to there took two steps. I mean, it was, and it was just boom, boom, and then double hand just dunked it. And we went silent <laughs> for two seconds until we realized he had dunked on our basket. Yes. And we erupted. We're like, yes. This is our day. We're going to beat Tennessee Temple. We're going to beat those Baptists this time. Well, it didn't turn out that way. By the middle of the second half, we were, we were getting killed. I don't know, it was like 20 points, 25 points. And our signs didn't seem to mean as much anymore. And but there was one guy, I don't even know who the student name is, but I'll never forget this. I guess he was saving the sign for the right moment, and the moment had passed because we were losing by 20 points. <laughs> and he stood up with this sign, like it was, we were, we, all the chants were gone. We were just quiet now. He stands up with this sign and points it at the Tennessee Temple student section. And all it says, he's just standing there like this. And it says, you can't choose, you're predestined to lose. <laughs> And we were like, yeah, take that. We got you. Even though you're beating us by 25 points. You know, what's sad for me, as I experience it for my, my, own, my, own, my own kids, which are now grown and, and my son graduated from here, but it was, what, what I miss for you or what it hurts me for you and even for us older people who are dealing with culture right now, that kind of, that kind of healthy, even fun is gone. There has been a, such a major shift in our culture in the United States, both outside the church and sadly within our Christian communities, to go from a, a place of healthy dialogue, even healthy competition, healthy, healthy disagreement, to land in a place now where as the, the author Arthur Brooks put it in an article in the New York Times just back in March. We have a culture of contempt. A culture of contempt. And as he wrote in that article, he brought up something that was written about, I guess in 2014, called motive attribution asymmetry. And motive attribution asymmetry is this cultural or sociological movement that's occurred in other parts of the world, but now it's occurring here. Where we can't just disagree with this other person, we actually have to hate them. And so they did this study, and they studied Palestinians and Israelis, but they also studied in America Democrats and Republicans. And what they, what they found, and these are just sociologists, this wasn't even a Christian study, is this, is this motive attribution asymmetry, which is this idea here, that my, if I disagree with you, I assume that the motive that I have in my beliefs is from a place of love and care and concern. And then I also assume the opposite of you, that the motives for your belief is a place of hate and destruction. And that kind of motive attribution asymmetry has, has swept over our culture. And brothers and sisters, it's even affecting our own churches, our own Christian communities. But there's good news for us this morning. There's incredible news for us this morning because you and I, 
as followers of Christ, are not bound by culture. But we've been freed by Christ. And so we have before us in the Word this morning, in the short time that we have, a, a pathway, a roadmap for how we act, how we interact. What do we do in these contexts? How do we as followers of Jesus respond? What is that way of freedom? There's a list here, and we'll go through it rapidly to understand the context, uh, or excuse me, the, the, the way in which we can face the context in which we find ourselves. First of all, in verse 24, Paul writes to, to Timothy and says this, And the Lord's servant, let's just stop there. The Lord's servant I would confess to you this morning, if I, if Todd Erickson could just get that part right in my own life, I would solve so many problems of conflict in myself and, and where I cause it for others. If I could just get right, Todd, you are a servant, not a spokesperson. You're a servant first, not a leader. You're a servant, not a voice. You're a servant and not only that, I belong to him. So I'm a servant to do whatever he asks. The Lord's servant. In Philippians, a book that is full of encouragement because Paul loves that church. But amidst his love for that church, he also recognized that there's conflict within that church. And he says in the beginning of chapter 2, and sometimes we miss this, we, we skip over this part because we want to get to the part where it talks about Jesus having uh, gone from heaven and come down and made himself a servant, was obedient to the point of death, and, and we see the exaltation, humiliation, and exaltation of Christ, we miss the point of why Paul brings, up, brings that up in the first place. He brings it up by, at the beginning of chapter 2 by saying, listen, if there's any common ground you have in Jesus, any fellowship you have as believers, then be unified. Have the same mindset as Jesus what was that mindset? He didn't think that his privilege and his, and, his, and his position were something to be held on to, but he made himself a servant and became obedient. He was the Lord's servant. Paul goes on as he talks to Timothy. Okay, you're the Lord's servant. And listen what I want, Timothy. I don't want you to be quarrelsome, but I want you to be kind to everyone. I don't want you to seek to find arguments. I don't want you to, to look for the opportunity to do that. One of the greatest things about being at Covenant College, frankly, one of the greatest things about being in a Presbyterian Reformed faith is the intentionality with which you pursue truth and even uh, the, the, the careful exegesis of Scripture. Knowing exactly, not going with our whims and our thoughts, but to really know and to fill our minds to understand a Christian world and life view. Oh, you're so good at that. We're, it's a blessing. It's a huge blessing. <laughs> but the but the bad part is we just love a good argument, don't we? We Presbyterians, we just, we, it becomes game for us. Paul says to Timothy, don't, don't do that. But instead, he says, be kind to everyone. Everyone. Inside the church, outside the church. And this kindness really connects to the gentleness that's speaking of there later. I can tell you, I know some of you have felt this. I've served in the church for 30 years. And the greatest hurts and misunderstandings and betrayals that I've experienced have been within my own church family. That's where I have been the hurt the most. Now, well, that makes sense, though, in the fact that we get close and we're broken human beings. It's not surprising. But boy, it's hard. It's really, really hard. But I'm supposed to be kind to everyone, even those who have hurt me, even those who misunderstand me, not so that they'll reciprocate, not so that they'll do the same thing back. I just reread probably the first time in a decade that I had, uh, or it's been a decade since I had read um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, Life Together. Phenomenal. The book on, the first chapter on community is, man, it is a message for all of us today. Christian community, what is it? And in that he says, Listen, if I'm being kind, if I'm pursuing love and fellowship for some kind of reciprocation from you, then all I have is human love. All I have is human love. This is not a fellowship in Christ. So Paul says to Timothy, you must be kind to everyone, not seeking reciprocation. 
And let me just give you a tip real quick on what that might look like even today as you walk this campus. Hey, whatever happens, how everybody, anybody responds to you today? Do the, do the 1 Corinthians 13 thing and assume the best. My brother taught me this years ago. He said, Todd, we make, we make assumptions every day when somebody says something to us or doesn't say something to us. And we're always guessing, right? We don't know. We can't look inside the person's mind. So whatever assumption we make, we're always guessing. He said, since we're guessing, let's just guess the best one. Right? Let's just guess the best one. So I, let's say a week from now, I walk across this campus and I see your champion, Grant Lowe, and I say, hey, Grant, and he looks at me and he looks down and keeps walking, doesn't say a word to me. I could assume, I could assume, wow, he's kind of a jerk. Now that I'm not speaking in chapel anymore, he doesn't really care. And maybe I'm right. But you know what else could have happened? He could have got, just gotten into a big fight with his wife Sandy and feeling really upset about it. And his mind is on that. You know what else could have happened? He could have just gotten a call from a doctor and found out that he had something really serious going on in his life or the life of one of his daughters. And his mind is on that. There's a lot of things that could be that probably most of them have nothing to do with me. Oh, brothers and sisters, assume the best. Just We're guessing. Guess the best one and roll with it. Be kind to everyone. And then he goes on. He says, ready to teach. It's interesting. When he's talking about kindness, he's not talking about passivity. He's saying, no, no, you need to know the truth. Like, know the truth. Make sure you really study your Bibles. Make sure you know the Christian world and life. Like I said, that's, the, that's a blessing of this place. You walk out of here with such a sharp mind. And you're, you engage the world so well. But as you engage, and it goes on here, he says, here's the way to engage. First of all, as you're ready to teach... Look what it says, patiently enduring evil. What's your first step as you engage the world? What's your first step as you engage each other? Be patient. Even if you're taking some blows from your brothers and sisters in Christ. Take them. Just be patient. Why do we do that? Because that's what Jesus has done for us. And if we're going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, if that's who I am, I, I say I'm a follower of Jesus. If I'm going to follow in those footsteps, this means that, 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 that I'm going to take some blows that maybe I don't deserve from brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm going to endure them. I'm not going to demand my right now. Right now. I'm going to share in the sufferings of Christ because that's what I'm called to do. So he says to Timothy, patiently endure evil. You're going you're gonna to have some evil in your life. You're going to have to endure it a little bit. Patiently take those blows as you interact, as you engage another brother and sister in Christ. And as you're doing that, he says, correct, I love this, with gentleness. Again, it's not passivity. It doesn't say, hey, endure some blows and be kind and smile and just be okay. That's not what he says. No, no, he says you can, you can correct. Correct your brother and sister. Correct those outside the world. But how do you correct? Correct with gentleness. It's not passive, but it's intentional. One of my dear friends is a, is a man named Michael Davis. He was a pastor on staff at Second Pres for a, a long time. And uh, now he's the teaching pastor at Downtown Presbyterian Church in Memphis. Again, one of my closest friends. This brother has loved me like Jesus. He happens to be African American, which has been really helpful to me because I had a lot to learn. And you know what? In our relationship, in our, our work and all this, he, he's experienced me saying a lot of boneheaded things and doing a lot of boneheaded things. But you know what this brother has done? He's been patient with me. And he's been gentle with me. He's corrected me. He's led me. But he hasn't punched me. <laughs> he hasn't made it his point to, to bring down a reign of terror on Todd. He hasn't dismissed me. He hasn't walked away from me. And in doing so, Michael Davis has been Christ to me. That's what I experienced. I experienced the touch of the Savior himself through this dear brother who has corrected me with gentleness. Who has corrected me with kindness. Oh, what a blessing that has been. And then finally, what does it say there? 
After we've done all that, after we've been kind, we haven't sought to quarrel, we're ready to teach, we're patiently enduring evil, we're correcting, we're not passive, it's not passive. But we're correcting with gentleness, then what do we do? Well, we keep going until they get it. Nope. (laughs) That's not what it says. It says, God may perhaps grant repentance. Now, repentance there, in this context, doesn't have to do with coming to know Jesus. It has to do with turning from what's false to truth. And what what does Paul say to Timothy in the end? Hey, listen, trust God with the results. You're 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 not the Holy Spirit in this person's life. It's you're not your job to fix them. You can't fix them. You be kind. You not, don't be quarrelsome. Correct with gentleness. And trust God for the results. Trust Him to do it. Put it in God's hands. I am deeply proud of my covenant heritage. I am, I am maybe borderline wrongly proud to be connected to all of you and probably one of the most sacred places in the world is this building and probably for me one of the most sacred memories at any point is to be in this building in this room singing our hymn all for Jesus and anytime I sing it anywhere else whether it's in my in my uh a sanctuary or in some other sanctuary in some other part of this country of the world every single time we sing that song, I straighten up. I feel like I'm, I'm part of this mission. And it reminds me again that everything is supposed to be for him. And I hear again those words. Since my eyes were fixed on Jesus, I've lost sight of all beside. So enchained my spirit's vision looking at the crucified i'm a follower of jesus you're a follower of jesus where's jesus going you're following him where's he going he's going to the cross and in that freedom in that freedom in that freedom you and i don't have to win you know i don't have to push and dominate in that freedom We can be kind to everyone. In that freedom, we can study and learn and know. In that freedom, we can correct, not passive, correct, but with gentleness. In that freedom, I can entrust my church family over to God's working, to His Holy Spirit. In that freedom, I can patiently endure evil. In that freedom, I can engage and speak like the Lord's servant because I'm free. I'm free. And because Christ has loved me, I can love you no matter what our difference is. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for the beauty and the power of your word. Take these things in your word and seal them to our hearts. And Lord, bless this great group here. Pour out your spirit upon them. Use them. And today, give them your peace, your joy, your grace and mercy that they might know that they walk with you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.